Hey guys, it's Bella, and in this video I want to do an artifact analysis of this image that you see here on the screen. This is a 6th century mosaic, so the 500s, from the Great Palace Complex at Constantinople. And it is said to depict a Gothic chieftain, and this has several considerations for the history of the Ottoman Gothic Kingdom in Italy. Um, there are a because in the 16th century, the Ostrogothic Kingdom went to war, or rather the Byzantine Empire, so the Roman Empire in the East, declared war on the Ostrogothic Kingdom. And Emperor Justinian recaptured Italy from the Ostrogoths and established Roman rule there. Now, so this is a time when the Eastern Romans are putting out a lot of propaganda, which is trying to barbarize the image of the Ostrogoths because it was increasingly unpopular to go to war against Christian rulers without good reason and the Ostrogoths were Christian although you wouldn't get that impression from looking at this mosaic um, and this is a really important consideration when you bear in mind that the two of the biggest historical sources on the Ostrogothic kingdom that we have these are the Greek writer Procopius and the Latin source, um, the Getica, um, by the historian Jordanes. Both of these authors, Procopius and Jordanes, were based in Constantinople, and so they would have been influenced by seeing this kind of artistic representation of the Goths around them. And an important factor to bear in mind in terms of what this is responding to. So this mosaic is trying to depict the Goths, but it's in response to the image of the Goths which King Theodoric was trying to put out. And we can see the rhetoric that King Theodoric uses in the, his official state papers that are recorded in Cassiodorus' Varie, which I recommend you consult if you want to learn more about the rhetoric of the Ostrogothic government at this time. He presents an image of the Ostrogoths as most civilised among the barbarian peoples and therefore most suited to in inherit the Imperium Romanum, the Roman Empire in Italy. And it is this image which the mosaic here is attacking most heavily. So King Theodoric, and presumably to a large degree his successors also, sort of retained a lot of Romanitas. So King Theodoric made mosaics as well, or commissioned mosaics. He, um, the, he repaired bathhouses, all the rest of this. He retained large aspects of Roman life. Um, but this image is trying to deny that any of this happens and imply that the barbarian Ostrogothic presence in Italy is in fact a barbarian presence and not a Roman presence in order to justify to the inhabitants of Constantinople the reclaiming of the Italian peninsula as removing the barbaritas, the barbarianness that is vested in the region. And we can see this in several important aspects of the image. So firstly, this chieftain here has a moustache, and this is a very common barbarian symbol. It seems to have been an important element of Germanic barbarian aesthetics. So we see it in the um, Sutton Hu helmet, we see it in the kings. So the Ostrogothic kings, in their coins, they depict themselves with this moustache. And actually, this roundel here with the face. It seems almost reminiscent of a gold solidus of King Theodoric where he's facing forward and you can clearly see the sort of elaborate moustache like that. Um, another element of barbarian dress, while the Romans would be completely clean shaven, they would also have rather short hair and the, bar and the barbarian here has really long flowing locks that go all the way around. And actually, if you look closely, his hair is not actually... Um, black at all like the Romans would have been. It's a sort of green. It's a green that merges into the foliage around him and this foliage up here on top of his head looks like a sort of weird approximation of the laurel crown, um, the sort of laurel wreath that the emperors of Byzantium would wear. But it's unkempt, it's out of order, it's not in a proper circle, it's just spilling out everywhere and it's growing into these like wild flowers. You've got poppies and other flowers all around here. And I think what this is attempting to communicate is that 
Ostrogothic attempts to incorporate Roman symbolism with more Germanic symbolism, as you see on the coins, if you look at coins from Ostrogothic Italy, you see the moustache, but you also see the sort of the Roman laurel wreath. But this mosaic is saying that that combination is not stable, that actually a barbarian cannot sustain Roman culture and a Roman aesthetic indefinitely. The um, the swirls also that these leaves go into, I think it gives a kind of restlessness to the image. You can see the motion going all the way around like this, swirling into the dog. And it gives this sort of sensation, this image that the Ostrogoths are a restless people. The Goths were known to have been a migratory people wandering all the way from wherever their origin was, presumably in Scandinavia, across Western Europe, attempting to find a homeland. And since the foundation of the Ostrogothic Kingdom in uh, 493 AD by King Theodoric, who was actually initially sent by Constantinople, oddly enough, the um, the Ostrogoths had been settled in Italy, but this image is trying to distort that image of solidity and of stability and say that actually the Goths were never fully settled. They are a barbarian people who cannot help but almost be migratory. And the um, the reef here leads into a dog as well, which is a very interesting image to have next to this figure of the Gothic chieftain. Um, the goth, sorry, the um, the dog sort of is it has a collar and it's an animal which should be subjugated and properly controlled. But if it's not controlled, can sort of steal and and maim and cause all sorts of havoc and prey upon the the local populace. Um, and this is giving an image, I think, of the sort of Anim- animalistic spirit of the of the Goths, which the Romans, the Eastern Romans under Emperor Justinian, have to tame, and this is the key um, component of the whole image. The whole image is trying to suggest that the Goths, as a people, as an ethnicity, are closely linked to nature and they're unable to control it. The Greco-Roman value of virtus was a sort of manly control which civilized people had over the natural world. And it wasn't a complete, a completely artificial state of being. It was rather a sort of an ability to live in balance, um, temperanzia with nature, temperanzia rather, with nature and with the natural world. Um, however, the um, the barbarians, the Romans believe, because they had an excessive amount of sort of well, I think it might have been one of the humans, so perhaps cholera, but like anger, and they were sort of too violent in their nature. They didn't have this level of control over their natural urges in order to live effectively and to live in a civilized way. And therefore they sort of revert to a more animalistic um, state of living. And this animalistic state is implied in this mosaic by all of the natural imagery, the folia and the um, the flowers and the dog. and this face of the gothic chieftain which is set up in a round little look almost like a coin which is a sort of very civilized thing which the ostrogoths were themselves producing but actually it it's distorted it's a coin but it sort of swirls out into this spiral it doesn't actually have a sort of complete circle and it's en- fully enmeshed in the natural world this gothic chieftain's face is sort of part of of the foliage here it's part of the sort of flora and fauna of the natural world it's not a human face. And um, what's quite interesting, and we can see this also, by the way, in terms of the anger in the red cheeks of the gods, sort of implying this barbarian fury, um, but also actually a kind of femininity. This, um, the red cheeks are a sort of sign, and the red lips as well are a sign of sexual arousal, which was, um, which was associated with a sort of homosexual um, submissiveness in the Greco-Roman imagination. Um, and this is not inconsistent with their violent, barbarous nature, because in the Greco-Roman understanding of virtus, um, passive homosexual uh, acts were said to be motivated by um, the inability of the um, the penetrated partner to control that with their manly virtus to control their natural desires, and so to give in to any sort of pleasure, regardless of the social acceptability of it. 
And it's the same lack of control which makes the barbarian peoples particularly angry and violent as represented by the dog. So we have this representation, almost a a, a two-gender or a sort of gender-fluid presentation of the Goths. We can see at once the sort of somewhat feminized, um, sexualized um, loss of control in the redness of this man's face. But we can also see the side effects of this in the anger and the the brutality of the dog represented here and perhaps there's an element also to the color of of sort of the the necessity to subjugate this sexualized and ferocious creature and we can see also going from the red we can see these stripes along here which are the own these are sort of just geometric designs however the um the red lines here are quite interesting and they seem to me to evoke this, um, to evoke the imagery of the, um, of the tunic, the, the togas rather, worn by Roman senators, which would notoriously have um, a purple stripe here. Now I imagine that purple is probably, maybe they didn't have purple colour for mosaics, or maybe it was too, um, maybe it was too expensive to incorporate into this mosaic. Um, but I think the stripe is meant to evoke this, and actually if you imagine this face, it almost looks as if it's um, somebody's head poking out from a bird's eye view of a senator's tunic. And the fact that it's red and not purple might also imply a sort of perversion of the Roman Senate, which was still meeting at the time. The Roman Senate actually communicated with Justinian quite a bit and was encouraging him to sort of invade and retake Italy because the Roman Senate believed that Emperor Justinian would restore their senatorial authority because in Constantinople, in the Eastern Empire, the Roman Senate was still um, playing a role in political life. So I think what's happening here is the image of the senatorial toga represented by these red stripes is almost overgrown all of a sudden by this barbarian foliage, the these plants that weave their way around it like weeds overtaking an abandoned building as some abandoned buildings in other parts of the former western roman empire were in fact being overrun by weeds as repairs of bathhouses and whatever increasingly fell out of fashion so we can we can see in all of this that how the how the eastern romans are trying to depict the barbarians and more particularly the goths and i think as a last point the fact that this figure here this face is referred to as a goth chieftain is especially relevant because again of king theodoric's um positioning of himself presentation of himself in his state papers as a very roman like figure and even in his iconography he depicts himself this way and he theodoric gives this image in his rhetoric that the Ostrogoths in particular, because of their um, Amal dynasty and their sort of heritage, are especially well suited among the barbarians to occupy and inherit the Italian peninsula and to continue the Roman Empire there. This mosaic is saying, no, this is not the case. This is the chieftain. This is the very best of the Goths. And even he is barely even a human he's an animal basically enmeshed in the world he's a dog who's going to pillage and plunder the um the riches of italy there's no christian symbolism here either even though the ostrogoths themselves were christian this is a almost heathen barbarian who worships a sort of aryan form of christianity which might as well to the eyes of the eastern romans be um be pagan they they persecuted heretics like king, king theodoric himself and so we can see here a direct refutation of the Theodoric, the Theoderican rhetoric as seen in Cassidorus's Vitae, that the best of the barbarian is still a barbarian. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you found this video interesting. And um, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more um, artifact analysis videos in the future. So until then, uh, Gorodach.